こんにちは、えー、本日は、えー、東京大学先端科学技術センター,、えー総発戦略研究オープンラボの、えー、公開ウェビナーにお越しいただきまして誠にありがとうございます、えー、本日はですね、えー、安全保障のトライアングルロシアによるウクライナ侵攻の中東と中国への影響と、えー、題しまして今年の2月24日に始まったこの大戦争がまあ、欧州だけではなくてその他の地域ユーラシア域内の幅広い領域にどのような影響を及ぼしているのかそしてまあ我々日本としてこの戦争の影響をどういうふうに考えるべきなのかということをですね、まあ、日本側それから中東の方、えー、それからロシアの専門家の幅広い意見を交えながら議論をしていこうと思っております。申し遅れましたけれども、私は東京大学先端科学技術研究センターの小泉と申します。私自身はですね、ロシアの安全保障を専門にしておりますので、まあ、今日はあのロシアのことについても話し合いたいと思うわけですけれども、まあ、しかし今申し上げましたように、この戦争は非常に巨大なものであって、ロシアだけとか、ウクライナだけ、あるいは欧州だけというふうに影響はとどまらないと思うんですね。今日はそういったこの現象の複雑な側面について皆さんと考えていきたいと思っています。えー、まずですね、えーと、参加者の先生方をご紹介する前に、えー、我々この、えー、ロールズ、えー、創発戦略研究オープンラボの代表を務めております池内聡教授から一言ご挨拶を申し上げたいと思います。えー、池内先生、お願いいたします。はい、えー、と私あ、東京大学先端科学技術研究センター、グローバルセキュリティ宗教分野の教授を務めております。また、あシンクタンクロールズ、えー、これは、アーケスト・オープン・ラボラトリー・フォー・イマージェン・ストラテジーズという、まあ、総発戦略、えー、研究オープン・ラボというものを主催しておりまして、この小泉さんと一緒に主催して、えーまあ、設立し、えー、運営しております。えー、今回はあ、まあ、私よりも小泉さんの主導による、えー、ロシアを中心としたロシアのウクライナ侵攻がもたらすものについて、えー、ウェビナーを企画しております。はいで,えーまあ、ですので、まあ、私はなるべく後ろにあの下がっていたいのですが、ただし、えー、今回は幅広く、えー、ロシアの専門家の方、それからあトルコ、まあ、現在は、えー、湾岸産油国、湾岸地域のカタールでもお教授をされておりますが、トルコの、えー、代表的な政治学のあ先生、えー、もお迎えしております。えー、それからまたあイスラエルの、えーえー、専門家も、イスラエルからも、えー、専門家を、特に湾岸地域の、えーえー、中東湾岸地域の専門家をお,お迎えしております。はい、そんなわけで、あの私からのご紹介はあ短くしようと思いますが、あえー、おさんご参加を招いております、えー。まず、ロシアからアレクサンダー・ガブエフさん、それから、えー、トルコからはシャーバン・カルダシュ先生。それから、えー、それからヨエル・クザンスキー先生を招いております。まあ、これについてはあの小泉さんの司会、えー、進行の中でまたあご紹介もあると思いますので、えー、簡単にご紹介するにとどめておきます。それではあの、えー、以上私,私から以上でございます。小泉さんよろしくお願いします。えー、池内先生、どうもありがとうございました。えっと、それではですね、まずあの本日登壇する先生方について簡単にご紹介をさせていただきたいというふうに思っております。まずあの最初のご講演をお願いするのは、カーネギー国際平和財団シニアフェローのアレクサンドル・ガブエフ先生です。ガブエフ先生はですね、あのロシア切手の中国専門家としてまず知られた人物でもありますし、あの最近ではこのロシアという国、あるいはこのえー、ユーラシアの秩序全体について非常に幅広い発信をされている先生です。あの私は実はあのラブウェフ先生とはもう、え
五六年前にお目にかかって以来お目にかかれていなかったもんですからちょっとまた会いたいなとずっと思っていまして、えー、ちょうどこう国際セミナーを行う、えー、補助金が取れましたのでぜひラブウェフ先生とも久しぶりに会いたいなという気持ちも込めて今回、えー、お声がけをしてみたら、えー、OK だよというふうにおっしゃってくれたので、えー、大変喜んでいるところですラブウェフ先生本当にありがとうございますそれからえっと、ヨエル・グザンスキー先生につきましては、テルアビブ大学の国家安全保障研究所、INSS の方にお勤めでいらっしゃいます。それから、シャーバン・カルダシュ先生は、カタール大学の湾岸研究プログラムの研究教授ということで、あの私はお二人に関しては面識がないんですけれども、やはりあの今回のウクライナでの戦争の件にしてもですね、それから2015年に始まったロシアのシリアに対する軍事介入にしてもですね、あのこれまでは中東というのは、まあ、私のようなロシアを研究している人間にはあんまり縁がないのかなと思ってたんですけども、やはり中東のこともわからないと、ロシアのこともわからない。おそらく逆に中東の政治を考える上でも、ロシアというファクターが非常に大きな比重を持ってきていると思うんですね。ですので今日はまあ日本のロシア専門家である私、それから日本の中東専門家である池内先生と、それからまあロシア人の専門家であるガブエフ先生、中東の専門家であるグザンスキー先生とカルダシュ先生、えー、そしてでプラスですね、われわれの、えー、研究プロジェクトの特任助教であります山口亮先生にもお入りいただこうと思っています。山口亮先生はですね、あのまあ、もともと北朝鮮の安全保障に関するご専門なんですけども、最近ではこのインド太平洋地域における安全保障全般に関して、非常に幅広く研究と発言をされている先生です。ということで、まあ、こういう幅広いメンバーで、ですねウクライナでの戦争という事象がどういうふうにこう波紋を広げているのか、まあ、その戦争そのものについて語るというよりは、その戦争が起こしている幅広いあの余波について語ってみたいというのが本日の趣旨であります。で、えっとまあ、ちょっと私からですね、もう少し詳しく、あの今回はあの私の問題意識というものをお話ししてから、各先生に20分ずつお話をいただいていこうと思っておりますけれども、私はあの今回のテーマにですね、安全保障のトライアングルという言葉を使っております。つまり、まあ、これ、今ちょっとお話を申し上げたわけですけれども、ウクライナで起きた事態というのが、そのウクライナをはじめとするヨーロッパに収まっていないというのが私の問題意識なんですね。例えばですけれども、あの今回、ロシアがウクライナで10ヶ月戦争を続ける中で、イランから自爆ドローンを購入するようになっています。でそれからあのイランから弾道ミサイルを買うんじゃないかというような話も浮上してきているわけですね。やはりちょっとと前の常識で言うとロシアがイランに武器を売るということはあっても、ロシアがイランから武器を買うということはちょっと考えにくかったと思うんですね。それから今回の戦争に関しては、やはりあのトルコが大きな存在感を見せているように思います。それはまあウクライナに対する軍事的な協力もそうですし、停戦の仲介役ということでもそうです。しかも今回、このウクライナで戦争が起こっている中で、まあ、トルコはまあ、そのナゴルノ・カラバフにおける戦争にせよ、シリアにおける戦争にせよ、まあ、一層影響力を拡大させようとしているように見えているんですよね。ということで、このウクライナにおける不安定状況が、またその近隣地域にも影響を及ぼしていく、そういうダイナミックスが認められるんじゃないかと思うわけです。もう一つ、あの今回の事態に関しては、アジアとの、えー、リンケージというものが、あのいくつか見られると思います、まあ、一番簡単なお話をいたしますと、えー、北朝鮮がどうもロシアに、えー、大砲の弾を売り始めたんではないかということは言われていますよね。えー、実はあの、えー、つい昨日ですかね、日本の新聞のスクープ記事として、えー、北朝鮮が初めて弾薬を実際にロシアに輸出したんではないかということが報じられています。まだ未確認ですけども、えー、事実であれば今年の秋ごろから言われていた北朝鮮がこの戦争に軍事的に関与するという事態が実際に発生したことになるわけですね。それから、あのー、やはり今回戦争になってロシアは経済制裁を受けている、ですから経済的に非常に厳しいですし、技術制裁も受けているわけですね。ですからこういろんな
現代的な生活とか産業を支えるための技術が入ってこない。そこで中国やインドへの接近が強まっていく。しかもこれも従来のように、ロシアが経済的にも技術的にも優位であるという関係でアジアに接近していくんではなくて、今やアジアの中国やインドの方がもう技術的に優位である、あるいはお金を持っているという状況でロシアが接近していく。まあ、世界史的に見てもなかなか珍しい状況が発生しているわけですよね。で、あのもう一点、これはやはり私たち日本人もアジアに住んでいるわけですけれども、ね、アジアにいる我々としても、この影響というのは顕著に受けているわけですね。あの私は今回戦争が始まってから、いろんなところから、えー、講演を頼まれるとか、アドバイスを頼まれるということがあったんですけども、やはりちょっと私が想像しなかったぐらい多くの企業がですね、ロシアからいろんなものを輸入している、あるいはロシアにいろんなものを売っている、でもそれがもう全部できなくなってしまったので、どうしたらいいんだと。いうようよな話を聞きますしあの当然、中国とロシアが接近していくということは、日本の安全保障上も非常に大きな問題があるわけですね。えー、ということで、あのこの問題は、やはりこうユーラシア大、まあ、この北側にロシアを中心とする旧ソ連世界があったとしますと、その南側に中東というまた別の世界があって、東の方にはアジアという世界があって、まあ、これらが完全にリンクしているわけではないんだけれども、密接な関係を持ったトライアングルを描いている、まあ、そういったそのダイナミックスが認められるんじゃないかと思うわけです。まあ、もしかしたらそんなものはないというふうに、えー、後から別の先生はおっしゃるかもしれませんけれども、それはぜひまた議論したらいいと思います。で、あのこういったその問題意識を持った上でですね、あの特にそのアジアの人間である私の問題意識をもう少し申し上げたいと思っています。で一つは私があの感じるのは、今回の戦争はこう世界史のコースを大きく変えるものというよりは、こう前から進んでいたプロセスを加速したのではないかというような印象を持っているんですね。例えばこうロシアが中国にえー、接近していくしかもジュニアパートナーとして接近していかざるを得ないということは以前から予想されていたわけですしかしロシアがここまで経済的に苦しい状況に追い込まれるであるとかそれからそのロシアにとって大きな力であった軍事力というものがここまで、えー、弱体化するということは、まあ、本来そんなに簡単には起こらないはずだったわけですよね。あの起こるとしても21世紀の半ばとか21世紀の後半以降にまで,かまで長い時間をかけて起こるはずだったプロセスであるとでそういうことが今回2022年に起こった戦争によって30年も40年も前倒しして起こってしまったんじゃないかと、まあ、そういう認識を持っているわけですで特に顕著なのはあのロシアがその経済と技術の両面で中国に依存せざるを得なくなってしまっているということですねあのえー、私あの、今起きている事態を見ておりますと、ロシアのウラジミル・ソローキンという小説家が2006年に書いた、えー、親衛大使の日という小説を思い出します。えー、ジェニオ・プリチニカーというんですかね、ロシア語で言うと、えー、という小説があるんですけども、これはあの2028年かな、2028年のロシアが舞台なんですが、この世界では皇帝が復活していて、えー、ロシアとヨーロッパの間には壁が築かれていて、えー、行き来ができなくなっていてで一方中国とは非常に仲が良いでその復活した宮廷の中では中国語を喋っている、まあ、そういう世界なんですよねで、まあ、もちろんこれはその偶話的な SF ですのですぐその通りになるということはもちろん思いませんけれどもあのいろんなものを暗示はしていると思いますつまりこうロシアがヨーロッパとうまくやっていこうと30年間したわけですけどもどうもうまくやっていけなかったさらにアメリカとはもっとうまくやっていかなかった一方中国とは、えー、いろんな利害関係はあるんだけれども比較的うまくやっていけるだからこうユーラシアの中央部にロシアと中国という緩やかな連合体ができていくんではないかみたいなそういう予感はちょっと私はこの小説からは感じるんですよね。でもちろんあの、ロシアと中国が公式の軍事同盟になるということはないと思っています
それはあの非常に、えー、日本にとっては嫌なシナリオなわけですけれども、おそらくロシアにとっても中国にとっても公式の軍事同盟になるということは、やっぱり避けたいシナリオなんだと思うんですね。中国もロシアもどちらもそれはありえないというふうに彼ら自身も言っている。ね、ただあの、そうではないとしても、やはりロシアはこれから先もユーラシアの中では一定の影響力を持った、特に軍事的影響力を持ったプレイヤーとして存在し続けるのでしょうし、それはあの中国の軍事的脅威というものを非常に気にしている日本にとっても、やっぱりこれから先もロシアが問題であり続けるということを意味するんだろうと思います。あのそろそろ私に与えられた時間がなくなってきましたので、あの本日ご登壇いただく先生方にですね、ちょっと私としてあの期待していることを申し上げたいと思うんですけれども、あの今日はですね、まあ、我々その研究者だけの研究会ではなくて、えー、一般の日本国民の人たちにも幅広く聞いてもらっているウェビナーという形式をとっております。で、あのー、日本人にとってですね、やはり中東というのはすごく遠い世界だと思うんですね。実は私も中東の国には一回も行ったことがないんです。で、それからロシアという国もやはりとても縁が遠い国だと思っている人が多いんじゃないかと思います。私はロシアを研究しているので、何回もロシアに行きましたけど、ほとんどの日本人はロシアにはほとんど行ったことがないし、えー、ウクライナに行ったことがあるって人はもっともっとずっと少ないわけですね。ですから、まあ、今日はですね、われわれの議論を手加減する必要はない、あの子供に語りかけるように話す必要はないと思いますが、われわれの議論を通じて、日本の人たちが、そうか中東ってこういう世界なのかと、ロシアの考え方ってこういうものなのかと、そしてそのさまざまな世界、日本から遠くにある別の世界同士がこういうふうに相互作用しているのか、あるいは実は日本との間にこういう相互作用があるのかというふうにあの何かを持ち帰ってもらえるような、そういう機会にできたらなというふうにあの思っております。えー、ちょうど時間になりましたので、私のご挨拶はここまでにいたしまして、えー、まずアレクサンドル・ガブエフ先生からお話をいただきたいと思うんですが、えー、よろしくお願いいたします。Many thanks, k o i z u m i s a n My name is Alexander g a b u e f I'm a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment. Before the war, I was based in Moscow and was chairing a program that studied Russia's role in the Asia Pacific and particularly Russia's relationship with China. After the war, I moved out, and Carnegie will reestablish its team that looks at Russia in Berlin next year. We are facing an unprecedented challenge in the Eurasian landmass, and unfortunately, This is the war that's very unlikely to end very quickly. So let me dive a little bit deeper into where the war goes, how it impacts the Russian economy, and then I will turn to the impact on the China Russia relationship because it's connected. So I will help to set the stage for, for other、uh, distinguished speakers. First of all,、uh, we are witnessing a pretty bitter war of attrition. Neither side, for now, has the ability to prevail on the battlefield. You saw that President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, has visited the United States. Yesterday, he has met with President Joe Biden, addressed the Congress, and asked for more military help. I would urge you. To go and watch the press conference or read the transcript of the press conference, because both President Biden and President Zelensky sound very grim and very realistic that next year we're going to see more military actions. And as much as the West wants Ukraine to win this war, it's unlikely that we're going to see full Ukrainian victory. Part of that is that Ukrainian victory means full re establishment of control over Ukrainian international recognized borders, including Crimea, including all of Donbass. 
this cannot or is unlikely to happen without a major Russian escalation. We've seen strings of this escalation and the current barbaric attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, knocking out the power grid and leaving millions of people in winter in cold without electricity, heating and running water is part of this escalation. As Ukrainian military success moves closer to what Russia considers part of its territory since 2014, Crimea, and if Russia is unable to defend them with conventional weapons, we might see an escalation in use of weapons of mass destruction. That's the risk that's baked in this conflict. The US administration is very much aware and worried about that. And that's where the provision of military support to Ukraine is tied to certain conditions and has some limitations. As much as the United States and its allies want Ukraine to win, they also fear that Vladimir Putin might create dangerous situations both inside Ukraine and create multiple hybrid threats, not necessarily direct military assault, but cyber assaults attacks on critical infrastructure inside NATO. And that's the scenario that the United States wants to avoid. Uh, Ukrainians have shown remarkable resilience, skill, uh, and they are getting a lot of Western help. Nevertheless, the country struggles because of heavy amount of casualties, both killed in action and wounded and decimating effect of the Russian war on Ukrainian economy that diminishes the tax base and makes it very hard to pay the salaries to the military and provide all of the basic state services. On the Russian side, of course, we've seen that the reputation of the Russian army or the expectations of many people have not been net we have significantly overestimate the Russian military power, and Russia has suffered very humiliating defeats in Kiev, Kharkiv, and Kherson this year. Nevertheless, Russia is still a formidable military force facing Ukraine. It has a lot of older equipment, old pieces of artillery, old tanks, old fighter jets, that it can bring to the battle. And it also has a lot of capacity to mobilize men and send them to the front lines. The quality of soldiers that Russia can produce is very low. The discipline is low, training is low, the equipment is old and bad, but still the sheer numbers of people Russia can mobilize is very hard to match for many industrial democracies. Uh, Russia has mobilized in two months 300,000 people, and that helped to stabilize the front line. So this winter, we are likely to see a grinding war of attrition uh, along all of the conflict lines. Russia might try to do a counteroffensive. It might do a counteroffensive next spring. But the bottom line is that this war is very unlikely to end with a negotiated settlement anytime soon we might see something similar to Iran-Iraq war that lasted for North Korea-South Korea war that lasted for many years and ended only because both sides were fully exhausted and didn't have much resources to go on forever. Uh, the impact on the Russian economy is big, but not as, uh, as uh, bad as many people have projected back in March when G7, including Japan, European Union, and all of the US allies have introduced unprecedented sanctions on Russia. Back then in March, the projections were that Russian GDP will collapse by 30%, and then Russia will have massive financial crisis, massive banking crisis, and then the technology will be uh, very much a disadvantage. Uh, what we are seeing is that due to the windfall of oil and gas money that Russia was selling its hydrocarbons 
to Europe and to Japan throughout this year, enjoying very high prices created by this crisis. It managed to create a very strong current account surplus. It managed to rebuild its currency reserves. And because of smart and prudent policy of the Russian central bank, the most challenging effects of the economic crisis have been mitigated. This year, we're going to see a recession in Russia around 3% of GDP. Next year, it's most likely will continue, but then around 2024, we might see some very slow recovery. As a result of this crisis, Russia will be a smaller economy, a poorer country, more technologically backward, but it still will have resources to carry on its terrible war against Ukraine. What plays an important role as the European Union continues to sanction Russia and introduce embargo on the Russian oil and gas, introduce the oil price cap, and launch various measures to disentangle an anti-European economy from its dependency on Russia, Russia is also weaponizing its exports of hydrocarbons against Europe and also cutting supply of natural gas and supply of oil to countries that implement the oil price cap scheme. As a result, Russia is left with the large volumes of hydrocarbons that it needs to send somewhere. And this somewhere and the lifeline for uh, keeping the country going is increasingly China. Uh, before the war, China-Russia relationship was already in an upward trajectory. Uh, since the uh, middle of 80s, when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union and Deng Xiaoping was in power in China, both sides set on a pragmatic trajectory, deciding that they need to end decades of hostility following the China-Soviet split. They need to sort out the territorial issue. They need to define border and commit res military resources elsewhere. That's what they did. Uh, China has the longest continental border with Russia. Russia has the second longest continental border apart from its border with Kazakhstan with China. And that means that this border needs to be border of peace. Then second pillar of this relationship has always been complementary structure of the economy. Russia has abundance of natural resources. It needs money and it needs technology. China is a So sources. And finally, both are authoritarian. Both are member similar and overlapping views on the international order and both together in the US most of the times. So of Crimea, Russia started to build more, more dependency on China. Before 2014, a uh, share of last year, share of China was about Kuizumi san do desu ka? Connection. Oh, I've lost connection. connection. I hope it's back. Oh. Oh, this guy. I'm a two yako no kata no. Kobe 
new sources of technology and new sources of financing. China was not aware that war is coming. On February 4th, President Vladimir Putin has visited Beijing. Both sides have announced a partnership without limits. But at this time, we don't have any indications that Vladimir Putin told Xi Jinping on what he is about to do in Ukraine. He never told most of the senior Russian officials, including Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and many other Syrian people, uh, senior people in the Russian power structures. So it's very unlikely that he shared his plans with a foreign leader. And then China before the war has left 6,000 Chinese citizens in Ukraine, unlike the US and unlike uh, American partners who evacuated their citizens before the war because they knew what's coming, China was pretty relaxed. So I don't believe that Xi Jinping was aware of what's going on. When the war broke out, China had to balance its two priorities. On one side, Russia was important for all of the reasons I mentioned. For the other hand, access to American and Western by extension, technologies, markets, financing is still vital for the Chinese economy. So China adopted a strategy that some might be called sitting on the fence. I would call it sitting on the Great Wall of China. Great Wall of China is big and pretty comfortable to sit on. Uh, in rhetorics, in talking points, China says that it supports Ukrainian territorial integrity, it supports Ukrainian sovereignty, and it supports, uh, it doesn't recognize annexation of Crimea and other territories, and it wants peace. And at the same time, it blames the US military alliances expansion across the world, including in Europe, uh, on what happened in Ukraine. And it also says that it stands against unilateral sanctions. So this sitting on two chairs allows China to carry on very well, depending on the audience, China cherry picks some of these messages and just carries them on saying that China was not aware of the war, China supports Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty, and China wants peace. In reality, China was also uh, helping uh, Russia by buying its hydrocarbons. Uh, China abides by US sanctions. China doesn't send war materials to Russia because it knows that sanctions and war materials constitute clear red lines for the Americans. That's not something new. That's the way China has reacted to 2008 war in Georgia and 2014 annexation of Crimea. So China usually stands by the sanctions. But everything else, everything what is allowed by the sanctions, or at least not forbidden, China does. So as a result, we see that last year, China-Russia trade was 150 billion US dollars. In 11 months of this year, we see that this trade volume has surpassed 170 billion and is set to continue to grow. China became the major provider of technology to Russia. For example, as Western car brands, including Japanese car brands, Toyota, Mitsubishi, Mazda, have exited the Russian market, Chinese companies have stayed. So among 14 car brands that are still in the Russian market, there are three Russian brands and 11 Chinese brands. Among cell phones, the most kind of growing market share is by Chinese cell phones like Huawei, Oppo, and others. So we see gradual growth of Russian dependence on the Chinese market, on China as a technology provider. And we also see that increasing amount of uh, trade is serviced through Chinese currency, through RMB. Uh, my final point is that as a result, uh, China will not provide a full compensation to Russia over markets that it has lost in European Union. Europe was 40% of Russia's trade before the war, it was the major source of investment and technology, and China is unlikely to match that. 
But at the same time, China will most likely provide just enough money, enough revenue, and enough technology for Vladimir Putin's regime to stay afloat and to continue going. China can do that without violating the sanctions. And as a result, five years down the road, we're going to see a much stronger dependency of Russia on China. The asymmetry between the countries has been there. The asymmetry will be fueled by the sanction, uh, by the sanctions and by this war, with China being much stronger and stronger partner. And I think that the leverage that China builds will allow uh, Beijing to squeeze out political and economic concessions from Russia, ranging from lower prices on Russian hydrocarbons, more favorable conditions, and also then political uh, concessions on Russia. I will give you two examples and then we'll stop. For example, if China five years from now asks Russia to stop selling weapons to India or Vietnam, Russia will not have that much to push back because most likely 60% of Russian trade on both exports and imports will live in China. Or if China asks to open a research base in the Russian Arctic, somewhere in the Novaya Zemlya Islands uh, or in Chukotka, uh, with a military component. It's a joint base, but which will have PLA Navy out there. Uh, I don't think that Russia will have that much reserves to push back because China, again, turn on and off pipelines that are bringing cash to the Russian regime. So we are entering a territory where protracted open-ended conflict in Ukraine leads to an increasing dependence uh, on China by the Russian regime. And that definitely creates serious challenges for everybody. It's not a perfect outcome for Russia, but unfortunately, because of Mr. Putin's tunnel vision, his obsession with Ukraine, and with pushing back against the US, he chooses to become more junior partner to China over any other options that he might have if he would not start this war or if he would arrive to a peaceful resolution of this war. Thank you so much. あのいつもながら大変に質屋の幅広いお話でとても勉強になりましたし、まあ、同時にこの戦争は軍事的にも終わらない制裁でも簡単には終わらない、まあ、非常に長引きそうだなという、えー、あまり明るくない予想を年末に持ちました。えー、それではですね、えー、続きまして、えー、グザンスキー先生にですね、えー、とご発表いただきたいと思います。グザンスキー先生、お願いできますでしょうか。Uh, good morning.、Uh, I hope you can all hear me. My name is Dr. Yol Guzanski. I'm speaking from Tel Aviv, Israel, and I will talk about the Middle East and the implications of the war in Ukraine on the Middle East and especially on Arab countries. Uh, the headline of this uh, presentation is Strategic Hedging、uh, by Arab Countries. Central Arab countries that are seen as pro Western、uh, in history have chosen a neutral position regarding the war in Ukraine. Several oil, oil producers in the Gulf. Have gone even further and seek to take advantage of the war to improve their standing. Even though most Arab countries still see their relations with the United States as a central element of their security, they are concerned about the reduced U.S. attentions towards. The Middle East in general,、uh, and specifically their security problems in particular. And now they're trying to establish a new equation in their relations with Washington. 
this hedging policy that I, I call it is a fixed element in their political toolkit. It aims to make use of Russia and China as an additional source of political, economical, and even military support. They want to use this pressure on the United States to, to pressure the US to adjust its policy towards the Middle East and towards them. Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, many Arab leaders that are seen as pragmatic and pro-American has refrained from criticizing Russia and even sought to distance themselves as much as possible from the crisis between Moscow and the West. Some have dragged their feet and not cooperated with the United States attempts to isolate, isolate Russia politically and economically. Although perhaps it is too soon to envision the long-term um, ramification of the Russian invasion to Ukraine for the Middle East, it is important to examine possible directions of development with an emphasis on the standing Arab countries and the role of great power competition in the Middle East. So if we look at how Arab countries conducted themselves from the beginning of the war, perhaps aside from Syria uh, and Iran, who has expressed full support uh, for Russia, Arab countries have sought and tried to maneuver between the poles, between the US and Russia. They want to maintain their core relations with the United States, but at the same time, not to harm their developing relations with Russia. This was emphasized in Arab League uh, resolutions and, and, and uh, mentioning regarding, uh, regarding the war. In the background of this stances are the changes in foreign policy of several Arab countries at whose core is the need to adjust to the changing circumstances, chiefly the stand of Russia and China in the region, strengthening their role and the expense of the United States. A central event that was interrupted as evident of Washington dubious credibility in protecting Arab state security was its lack of military response to the Iranian attack on strategic oil facilities in Saudi Arabia in 2019. And later on, uh, in the beginning of 2022, in January of 2022, in the UAE. The view that Arab countries cannot depend on the United States to come to their aid if they're attacked, is strengthening uh, by the events in Ukraine. And it's reflected in the writing of several Arab columnists uh, in the Arab press. This strategic hedging, as I call it, by Arab countries has been reflected in recent years in strengthening relations with China and Russia. Some of the countries, especially in the Gulf, cooperate with Russia on regulating oil prices in so-called OPEC plus. They acquire weapons uh, from Russia. And I'm not talking about Iran providing weapons to Russia, but I'm talking about the Gulf states and Arab states acquiring more and more uh, Russian weapons, especially Egypt, but also in the Gulf. And they also enjoy Russia uh, uh, tourism uh, coming, coming to the Gulf. 
uh, significant immediate effects of the war uh, in Ukraine also include an effect on the more poor countries in the Middle East. Uh, uh, the war in Ukraine included a, crop, a sharp uh, rise in energy prices. In the beginning of the war, the price of a barrel of Brent crude reached almost $130 a barrel. But since it declined, it's now currently around $80, $90 uh, of barrel. This has a positive effect, of course, on the more rich side of the Arab uh, uh, countries in, uh, in the Gulf, but it's negatively affected uh, some of the poor countries that are dependent not just on oil uh, import, but also on grain and wheat. Uh, and this is especially true uh, for uh, 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 Egypt in particular. Uh, on the other side, the war again illustrate the strategic importance of the Gulf to the global energy economy and the increasing potential value of the Gulf Arab uh, countries. In this con context, we've seen the U.S trying uh, to get uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, the world's large, largest oil exporter, to increase their oil production in order to try to mitigate the rise in oil prices that occurred since the beginning of the war. But so far, in vain, the US actually didn't succeed in that. The countries have emphasized their commitment to the agreement with Russia, the OPEC Plus uh, member, but also said that this is purely an economic uh, decision by them uh, not to produce uh, more oil. Uh, reportedly, uh, before Biden visit uh, to Saudi Arabia, some of the uh, Gulf uh, leaders have, in, have been even refused to speak to President uh, Biden. Uh, we saw Xi Jinping, uh, president of China, visit uh, last week in Saudi Arabia as another uh, step perhaps forward in this direction of some of the Gulf states, and particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, to even go further in their hedging uh, maneuvers uh, and take the, the relations with China uh, even further. But as the world attention is directed towards Ukraine, uh, the concerns of Arab countries are related to the emerging nuclear agreement with Iran that in their eyes might benefit uh, Iran. The Gulf countries in particular uh, are concerned by the growing uh, power of Iran and they're concerned by the growing uh, connections between Russia uh, and Iran. To sum up, uh, Central Arab countries, I think, will continue to diversify their political, economic, and even military uh, connections with Russia and even more with China while well, try to preserve their relations uh, with the US. Uh, China cannot offer the Gulf states what the US can offer militarily, but it can offer other things, especially economically. Uh, and and the, the choice of some of the Arab countries to preserve sort of neutrality uh, indicate a change that has already begun and taking place in the standing of the United States in the Middle East. This is, I think, very important. Most Arab countries recognize that at the present time, they don't have good replacement, good alternative for the advantages of the US, especially in military affairs. And they still see close relations with the US as central element of their security. This is despite 
Washington reduced attention towards the region in general and their security problems in particular. In their view, they must compensate for the deficiency in several ways. They will try to intensify the military power. They will try to maintain proper relations with Iran. And at the same time, strengthen their relations with other countries and great power alongside their relations with the United States. And I'm specifically mentioning China. In other words, even if the United States renewed its attentions towards the Middle East, now and maybe after the war in Ukraine, um, and as part of this goes way towards Arab countries, the rise of the involvement of other great powers in the Middle East is expected to continue and even deepen. And with that, Arab policies of hedging risk and opportunities will continue as well. Thank you. ザンスキー先生どうもありがとうございましたやはりこの中東という地域のひまあその中東というじ地域自体が持っている非常に複雑なダイナミクスとそれからこの中東という地域とアメリカ中東という地域とロシアというふうにまあそれぞれの,その生きがい大国との関係性の複雑さというものも非常によく分かったと思いますで一方で,です、ね、もう本日はもう一お一人あの中東から、えー、とスピーカーをお招きしておりまして、カルダッシュ先生にも、えー、お話をいただきたいと思います。えー、カルダッシュ先生、えー、続きましてお話をお願いできますでしょうか。Uh, thanks a lot.、Uh, also, thank you for. The invitation、uh, for this excellent、uh, panel of experts on the、uh, region and also the implications of、uh, Russian Ukrainian、uh, conflict. Actually, I am very pleased to、uh, see to some extent that、uh, some of the、uh, points made by the previous speakers overlap with what I was planning to、uh, emphasize.、Uh, but Also, I will try to avoid the overlaps as much as、uh, possible. I was asked to reflect on the implications of the conflict for both Turkey and the Gulf、uh, countries, especially、uh, how the GCC、uh, member states have approached the conflict. But to some extent, the previous speaker, Joel. Already、uh, reflected on that、uh, part of the、uh, question in the context of the broader、uh, Middle Eastern、uh, reactions.、Uh, but in that respect, I will try to focus more on the Turkish、uh, context, perhaps.、Uh, let me briefly share with you my own observations about what the broader geopolitical implications of this unfolding uh, conflict uh, implies. In general, and then what it means for the Middle East and what it means uh, for uh, Turkey.、Uh, I agree uh, with uh, Kozimi's uh, argument that this is not a major geopolitical game changer. At the beginning, let me also reiterate the same、uh, feeling, same observation.、Uh, the broader geopolitical trends that were Already there, they are still uh, shaping uh, the geopolitical scene internationally and also regionally. So, in that sense, we have not entered into a new uh, era uh, in terms of the broader parameters, security parameters. So, the way he put、uh, the conflict accelerated、uh, Existing,、uh, previously existing geopolitical trends. I think this is an excellent、uh, way to、uh, frame it. To some extent, yes, the conflict、uh, accelerated what had been there already, but at the same time, the conflict was also a kind of 
culmination point of what had been building up for many years, for uh, several decades almost. Especially uh, from a, a Eurasian uh, perspective, the issue of the emerging Russian revisionism or neo-revisionism in particular, and the broader issue of the neo-revisionist powers in the international system in general. I think it has been already building up and the implications uh, of this new phenomenon for the broader international order. This is what we were watching uh, before this conflict, especially in the context of Russia, what had been unfolding since 2008, uh, the Russian uh, Georgian conflict and Russia's uh, invasion of uh, parts of uh, Georgia. And then uh, 2014, the Crimea uh, annexation. So the unfolding of this new uh, revisionist, new revisionist policy in a militarized manner and what it meant uh, for the Eurasian security, but also European and transatlantic security. There were many indicators that things were moving in a direction where that revisionism was gonna take a bolder and bolder and bolder stance in a very militarized fashion. But despite all these signs, uh, the Western strategic community, uh, the transatlantic security community preferred to handle uh, with this challenge in different ways. They did not want to confront it uh, directly. They did not want to devise a policy of containment, which is being discussed now, they did not want to uh, devise a very militarized response. So in that sense, we have been already talking about what is uh, today's much more open uh, term as the return of the great power uh, politics as a result of these neo-revisionist reflexes of some of the uh, great powers. And to some extent, the discussions about uh, China, the rise of China, uh, the a more aggressive language coming uh, from Beijing mirrors the same dynamics. And the question is, can we see a kind of uh, a militarized uh, outburst on the part of China and what it would imply for the regional uh, context in Asia and also broader international system? So yes, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is not necessarily a game changer, it is accelerator, but it is also a culmination point because the trends were already there, the signs were already there, but many actors did not want to respond to this development the way that such a revisionist policy would require. So this is uh, a very important point, which I will come back when I uh, talk about uh, the Turkish uh, context. And a second uh, general observation, especially uh, for the Middle East, uh, this general observation might be in order. So how we see uh, the Middle East within the international system, usually we tend to define it from a scholarly uh, academic uh, perspective. It is a, a subsystem within the international uh, system. And in that respect, what happens uh, in Russia, Ukraine conflict, it happens mostly in the context of the Eurasian uh, uh, geopolitical sphere in the context of the uh, European theater. So in that sense, the implications of the conflict for the Middle East are secondary. And then the question is how the broader Middle East is reacting uh, to this development. And this is where, again, uh, my comments will partly overlap with uh, Joel uh, Guzanski and the concept he uh, proposed to define the uh, reactions of the regional countries, which I was also gonna uh, use, which I also believe is the case, the hedging, strategic hedging uh, behavior. So in this sense, the current international systemic uh, condition is favoring the hedging behavior. So it is not just uh, what he said that the countries uh, prefer to act in a kind of hedging manner, but also the systemic 
condition, the broader systemic condition, stimulates, sends signals that hedging might be the best strategy at this uh, geopolitical uh, juncture. So in that sense, why it is the case, this is a deep discussion. Uh, I don't think uh, I can go into that at this uh, point because it will require quite a, a, an extended discussion. But the discussions about the systemic uh, transitions, power trans transitions, the shift of world economic power to uh, uh, Asia, the rise of uh, China, the West, uh, unwillingness of the West to continue uh, on the military spending, so on and so forth. But uh, the fact that now countries are more keen to uh, preserve and assert their strategic autonomy, uh, their national priorities. So when we add all these factors uh, together, we see that the hedging strategy uh, is a kind of preferred uh, option uh, for many countries. but. This hedging uh, sometimes in the uh, discussions can be seen as a kind of pejorative term in the sense that hedging is considered as a kind of opportunistic attitude, very short term uh, response, uh, short term thinking. Personally, I don't know what other speakers uh, think on that issue, but I don't agree with this uh, kind of characterization of the hedging because it is a strategic choice for countries. It can be short-term driven, but it can also uh, be part of a kind of long-term uh, calculation. I think this is where uh, a point which was already made by Alexander is very important. We don't know how the conflict will unfold. We don't know whether uh, one year down the way we will be still uh, talking about the conflict, but Alexander suggested that uh, very likely uh, we might be uh, still continuing uh, talking about the ongoing conflict one year, two years down the way, because uh, there is a high uh, probability that it won't end anytime uh, soon. And uh, as a result, it can be uh, evolving into a situation of a kind of uh, frozen conflict in the uh, Russian way, in the Russian uh, near abroad, similar to other uh, patterns, it can be a kind of appropriated uh, conflict similar to uh, Iran-Iraq war. But what is clear, which is also uh, my opinion, it won't any, uh, end anytime soon. So countries like Turkey, like other Middle Eastern countries, other uh, world powers. So what they are doing, they see that uh, they need to be prepared for the long haul, long term. So in that respect, they don't want to fix uh, their policies. They don't want to fix their commitments. They don't want to close the options. So they want to be prepared for different eventualities, depending on how in the mid to longer term the conflict will uh, evolve. And therefore, hedging becomes more of a uh, preferred strategy for uh, many uh, countries, including Turkey and uh, uh, other Middle Eastern countries, uh, Gulf countries involved. And then let me add another point about the hedging uh, discussion. Hedging is not necessarily always uh, trying to maintain good relations with both sides, is not necessarily always also trying to keep the ties with Russia. But right now what we see, especially in the case of uh, the Gulf countries, and especially uh, to some extent uh, Turkey, hedging is expressed in a way that they don't want to go with the American uh, policy uh, unconditionally. So they don't want to just uh, delegate their strategic choices uh, to the uh, Western uh, or the American priorities. This is, I think, very important. It is not because they want to keep the ties with Russia. It is not uh, necessarily because they want to deepen the ties with Russia, but it is more about trying to be more cautious, 
in following the Western uh, or the US transatlantic lead in this crisis. So the best example, which was also uh, raised by uh, Yoel about the uh, Saudi OPEC decision uh, regarding the oil prices, so on and so forth. So here, the countries do not want to give up, do not want to compromise their own national strategic priorities, economic in interests for the sake of Western definition of this uh, crisis. So this is also the same uh, for Turkey when it comes to uh, how to respond to the uh, Russian uh, uh, war on uh, Ukraine. And after these broad uh, observations, uh, let me move to a couple of more uh, concrete uh, observations regarding the implications of the conflict uh, for the Middle Eastern uh, context. And then this issue of the great power uh, conflict, the great power competition, the return of great power comp uh, competition. Yes, it is the case. It has been building up already. And some people, uh, some strategists were already arguing about it, but many uh, prefer to downplay it. But now it is out there. It is out there in the open. It is hard to downplay. Nobody can uh, ignore uh, the reality of the great power competition when uh, we engage in strategic conversations. And then already many countries have been re uh, revising their national security strategies, uh, thinking about uh, ways to improve military defense spending, so on and so forth. We have seen the uh, announcement of uh, the Japanese strategy. We have seen the German reaction and other countries, the worldwide uh, military spending, so on and so forth. So it is a reality, the hard power, power politics, geopolitical uh, competition is back. It is uh, on the strategic agenda. Uh, we cannot ignore it. And then uh, the good news uh, for the Middle East is this time the Middle East is not necessarily the main uh, theater uh, of this geopolitical struggle. So it is the secondary stage. So it comes with, I think, uh, both good and bad uh, implications for the Middle East uh, in general. Uh, good in the sense that it leaves room uh, for the uh, regional countries, Middle East countries, broader strategic uh, room to maneuver in this new environment. But uh, it also raises intra-regional security uh, dynamics, especially security competition, especially the attention of the great powers moving to uh, European theater uh, may trigger new uh, security competition uh, among the uh, regional actors in the uh, Middle Eastern context. And we are partly seeing that. And then uh, different regional uh, players, regional powers will make use of this new strategic maneuver room uh, in their own ways. And there is a risk that it may uh, also trigger uh, some uh, regional uh, competition and risk of confrontation. And then the, one of the good examples is how, for instance, uh, Turkey is uh, accelerating pressure uh, on Syria uh, by relying on the military instruments, uh, the uh, PYD, uh, YPG uh, elements in Northern Syria, how uh, Turkey is uh, now more eager to use the military instruments. And again, Iranian policy uh, toward Iraq uh, is another example. Iran's unwillingness to uh, negotiate uh, a more peaceful uh, resolution of its nuclear dispute with the United States on the one hand, but also uh, the ongoing talks with uh, Saudi or other Arab countries. So I think uh, on the one hand, this crisis implies that there is bigger space for regional powers, but uh, this, in this bigger space, there might be more strategic uh, competition uh, among the regional powers, which may eventually uh, trigger uh, some uh, conflict uh, potential. And here, another observation uh, is relevant, I guess. 
the attention span uh, of the international community on the uh, regional uh, hotspots uh, in the Middle East, now it is over. And then attention is no longer on resolving the Syrian crisis. Attention is no longer on resolving the Iraqi crisis. Attention is no longer on resolving the Libya uh, political and uh, security uh, problems. So in that sense, uh, the sub-state, intrastate uh, crisis uh, conflicts in the Middle East will be unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. They will be uh, continuing in this protracted uh, manner. And I think uh, this suggests that the low key security challenges uh, in the Middle East uh, will continue because without solving the uh, situation uh, in uh, Iraq, in uh, Syria, in Libya, the Middle East uh, will always remain as an unstable uh, place and it will continue to produce security problems for everybody, including Turkey and uh, Gulf countries. So uh, the attention of the international community as it shifts to uh, Eastern uh, European uh, theater, Eurasian context, now in the Middle East, all these unresolved conflicts will be a big uh, challenge for regional actors uh, to deal with. After all these observations, let me also talk briefly about the energy geopolitics uh, dimension. Uh, before the uh, war in uh, Ukraine uh, started earlier this year, the big talk in the energy uh, scene was about the green transition, greening, uh, moving beyond uh, the hydrocarbons. But as we have uh, seen, the conflict has reminded the uh, geopolitics of conventional energy uh, resources. Again, the uh, transportation routes, uh, diversification of sources, suppliers, and transition, uh, transition routes. So I think this is... Uh, gonna be uh, shaping the energy scene uh, for some time. And then when we were suddenly talking about the end of the uh, hydrocarbons age, moving to the new green energy, so on and so forth. Now we are again back to this uh, conventional energy geopolitics uh, parameters. It is there, it will be relevant for uh, some couple of years, but it won't uh, kill the energy transition uh, discussions either. Uh, so in that sense, the energy scene uh, will be shaped by both the classical conventional geopolitical approach on the one hand, and also the discussions about the energy transition, green transition on the other hand. So it will uh, not kill uh, the uh, green uh, energy discussions, especially in the European context, it will continue to be the case. Very briefly, uh, before I go over my time, uh, let me talk about uh, Turkey in uh, more uh, specific uh, terms. This crisis has been a major uh, challenge uh, for Turkey because like other European countries, Turkey is gonna be affected by the Russian revisionism in a direct way because unlike other Middle Eastern countries, Turkey faces with Russia directly because it has overlapping neighborhoods with Russia. Uh, of course, Turkey is unique uh, in the sense that it's a multi-regional power. It is part of the Middle East. It's part of the Mediterranean uh, area. But at the same time, Turkey is a Eurasian power. It's a Black Sea power. And there, uh, Turkey has uh, overlapping neighborhoods. Uh, with Russia overlapping uh, strategic uh, priorities. Sometimes uh, Turkey's interests and priorities uh, align with those of Russia, but uh, in many times, uh, Turkey and uh, Russia stand on opposite uh, sides in terms of uh, their position on some of the regional issues. So the evolving 
neo-revisionist Russian uh, foreign policy, at least since 2008, has been a strategic challenge to Turkey. Just as it was a major challenge to other European countries, and Turkey preferred to deal with this challenge in its own ways. Turkey did not want to confront Russia. Turkey didn't confront Russia upfront, but still, despite that, uh, Turkey also took steps to uh, counter uh, Russian expansion to some extent, but it wasn't a clear re reaction. It wasn't a clear uh, balancing uh, policy against Russia. And 2014 uh, annexation of Crimea was another challenge uh, to uh, Turkey. Still, uh, Turkey uh, preferred to deal with this challenge in unique ways without burning uh, bridges uh, with Russia. On the contrary, Turkey kept uh, building uh, new bridges with Russia, took new uh, decisions to deepen uh, partnership cooperation with Russia, such as the Turkish Stream uh, project. So this was interesting. This is uh, what uh, led uh, many people to call uh, Turkey's policy as hedging. But this new conflict uh, made the issue of uh, Russian revisionism so open, so obvious, as I uh, mentioned at the very beginning. Nobody can ignore it. The Germans cannot uh, ignore it. Uh, the Poles uh, have been always saying, uh -huh, this is a major strategic uh, challenge threat. But at the same time, uh, Turkey cannot ignore it uh, either. Now we have to live with this new reality. Russian revisionism is out there. We cannot just turn uh, the other way around and ignore this uh, problem. And I think this is the reason why uh, Turkey has been uh, continuing its policy of supplying uh, military assistance uh, to Ukraine in the middle of the conflict. Turkey has taken a supportive position inside NATO uh, about measures against Russia. And then uh, Turkey has taken certain uh, military measures to restrict the movement of uh, ships through the uh, stress zone and so forth. So on the one hand, Turkey realizes that uh, it cannot let this Russian revisionist course to continue. But at the same time, uh, Turkey kept maintaining the ties with Russia, not only maintaining, but also took some steps to deepen uh, further the ties with uh, Russia in the middle of the conflict. The uh, construction of the nuclear power plant is ongoing. Uh, it is uh, accelerated. And then there, uh, there have been different uh, contacts between the presidents of Turkey and uh, Russia. And we have seen uh, recently the Russian president Putin uh, talking about making Turkey as a kind of major trading uh, point for Russian gas in the European context, so on and so forth. Turkey has uh, maintained its uh, trade with Russia. Turkey did not support the sanctions. So uh, at the same time, uh, Turkey wants to maintain the engagement uh, with Russia. This is, I think, the reason why it is called as a kind of hedging policy. Yes, it is. But I think there is more than just a hedging policy because Turkey realizes that in these overlapping uh, neighborhoods, uh, strategic neighborhoods with Russia, stability is more important than instability. So engaging uh, with Russia is seen as a way to ensure stability in the other region, in the Caucasus, for instance, in Central Asia. And especially the way the Turkish leaders have uh, framed uh, Turkey's policy, they are very keen to ensure that the Western reaction to Russia will not create a kind of backlash, will not uh, create further destabilizing impacts in the broader Black Sea region, in the Caucasus and in Central Asia, because yes, uh, they say that uh, Russia needs to uh, observe the international borders, should withdraw and the conflict. But from the Turkish point of view, the way to push Russia into uh, this option should not create bigger problems than we face now. 
So this is the kind of strategic uh, nightmare for Turkey. This is where I will finish. Always the Western policy, the Western, especially US policy in the region creates negative externalities, side effects for Turkey's own policy. This is what we observed in 2003 uh, after the US uh, invasion of Iraq. This is what again, Turkey observed in 1991 after the uh, Gulf War. Yes, dealing with one challenge is good, but the question of how to deal with it, at what cost, at what implications for Turkey, in the wake of all American interventions in Turkey's military uh, strategic uh, neighborhood, there were always bigger problems left for Turkey afterwards. And this is the kind of concern I think that shapes Turkey's strategic thinking at this point. Yes, responding to Russia is necessary, good, but at what cost, at what implications? And this is uh, shaping uh, Turkey's uh, thinking on Russia to a large extent. And therefore, Turkey doesn't want to give up the engagement with Russia because just uh, following the American uh, Western uh, understanding of how to respond to Russia at this point may create bigger troubles in the future than what we face now. This is the kind of, again, thinking, strategic thinking that perhaps shapes the uh, calculations of other uh, Gulf countries, other Middle Eastern countries. And that's why uh, this is where I will uh, conclude. We don't see a kind of bandwagon effect uh, behind the West, behind the American agenda uh, in this conflict. Thank you. Kardashi Sensei, Taihen, Arigato, Gozaimashita. Ano, Yapri Kono, Turko, no, Desne, Russia, to Rinset, Steru, to you, Sono, 地政学的な条件がやはり先ほどの、えー、グザンスキー先生がおっしゃった中東湾岸諸国の条件あるいはイスラエルの条件とは大きく違うなというふうにお話を伺いながら、えー、思っていましたそれからあの3人の先生方のお話を聞いてみるとやはり思うのは、まあ、今回の戦争ロシアによるウクライナへの侵攻というのは簡単には止まらないし簡単には終わらないだろうとでまあその中でまあ、ロシアも簡単にあの体制が崩壊するとか、軍事的に戦争が続けられなくなるということはないということは、ガブエフ先生がおっしゃった通りですし、まあ、その中東の国々にせよ、それからまあト,ルコのトルコにせよ、えー、ロシアの行為に対して、まあ、このロシアの行為に真っ向から賛成するということもしないのだけれども。えー、じゃあそのアメリカや EU や日本のように制裁を科してロシアを止めようとするわけでもないあくまでも自分たちの利益の中で、えー、ロシアという国に向き合っていく、まあ、そういう姿勢があ,のありありと見えたなというふうに思いましたで一方で私聞きながら思ってたのは日本はじゃあ同じことができるだろうかということを考えてみるとやはり日本人特に日本の安全保障専門家の多くは今回の件をロシアとの直接的な関係性というのはもちろんそうなんですけれども、やはりこう中国という国との関係性という点から見てしまうと思うんですね。でつまり中国という国が経済が伸びている。それから昔のソ連と違って中国は、えー、経済力あの、テクノロジーも伸びているで。軍事力もものすごい勢いで増強されているというときに、今の今回のロシアの振る舞いが成功してしてまうつまり、まあ、あのロシアが軍事力を使ってこの戦争の目的を達成してしまうということは日本人にとっては非常に不気味なことに見えるわけですね。じゃあ中国の習近平が我々も同じことができるではないか台湾でも同じことをやったらいいではないかというふうに思われては、まあ、日本としては困るわけです。ですからあのおそらくこの我々から見た場合の,この今回の問題の特殊性、今日話していただいたロシアや中東の3人の先生と我々との大きな違いというのは、多分こうロシ,アや中ロシアやアメリカのことを見ながらあの今回の件を語るのか
、えー、あるいは日本人のように、ロシアという国も見てるんだけど、同時に中国という国を見ていて、そしてもしも中国が何か軍事的な行動を起こした場合には、あの中国と真正面から対峙しなければいけないという地位にいる我々との、えー、差というのが非常に大きいんではないかなというふうにも思いました。さて、えっと、少しまだあの時間がございます。で今日はです、ね、2人、えっと、コメンテーターをお願いしています。で一人はですね、えっと、我々のさっきご紹介した、えー、山口亮先生です。で、今日はあのまずはそのロシアの先生、中東の先生からご発表いただいたわけですけれども、一方、えー、山口さんは、えー、オーストラリアで育って、韓国で去年まで大学の先生をしていたというキャリアの持ち,です持ち主ですから、まああの、ミスターインド太平洋みたいな人なんですよね。で、その山口さんから見た場合に、えー、今日の先生方のお話はどんなふうに見えたのか。えー、とちょっと時間が押しておりますので、8分ぐらいでコメントしてもらえますか。はい、どうも、英語先生、ありがとうございます。Um, okay, so, I'll,、uh, so thank you very much、uh, to、uh, our three great presenters.、Um, and it's, again, it's always a great pleasure to be part of fan events, fantastic events like this.、Um, and so, again, I thank the、uh, presenters for their great insights、uh, on what is a very interesting and important theme. Um, and when I listen to the three presentations,、um, they are very much complete、uh, in 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 way that you've covered all the、uh, key points.、Uh, but at the same time, the underlying sort of factor that I got from all the three presentations was that we see major dilemmas、right, uh, everywhere.、Um, and I think that really underscores the complex nature of the relations and leverages、um, amongst China, Russia, And Middle Eastern states, but also beyond as well.、Um, and I understand that the theme of uh, this uh, uh, conference here uh, is about、so、this trilateral relationship. But I think we need to be careful here、uh, in that when we look at topics like this, we have to be careful in the way that we must distinguish whether we actually have a triangle in shape or. Do we just see three sets of bilateral relations that have varying degrees、um, of, sort of impact on one another? And that's something that we really need to sort of think about a lot.、Um, and the three presenters today, I think, raised the key questions to sort of unravel, sort of solve that puzzle.、Um, and when I Listen to the presentations very carefully, and I learned a lot from all this.、Um, obviously, there's a lot of attention and assumptions regarding you know, what the dynamics of this、uh, triangle is.、Uh, but I think the most important is not simply about what they are doing, what the states are doing, but what the expectations are amongst those states,、uh, because that is what will really render the strength of the strategic relations and also the impact that they will have、um, not only amongst the three uh, 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 regions and countries, but also beyond as well. And so I'm just going to throw、uh, you know, some several questions uh, uh, to the three presenters、uh, today.、Um, some of them are very basic,、uh, and some of them may just open up a new sort of uh, 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 a box of、uh, questions in themselves.、Uh, but I just thought like, you know, these、uh, questions will try to, I want to try and sort of provoke a lot more discussions here.、Uh, so, first,、uh, Dr. Gavev,、uh, again, thank you very much、uh, for your、uh, talk about China and Russia.、Um, I look at China a lot in my uh, uh, in my research uh, and all my, my in, in my consultations as well. And this is a very important topic. And I think a lot of people misconceptualize、uh, the China Russia relationship. And so, two questions I have is this In your view, how does Uh, Russia see the Indo Pacific region? Because I think this is going to be a very important question when it comes to the China Russia relationship. It's the real litmus test in many ways. And do you see any changes in Russia's perception towards the Indo Pacific security environment, particularly when we think about the two, two flashpoints? One is obviously the Taiwan Straits. How does Russia see that? And also, another one which does directly relate to Russia in many ways because of the border, and that is the Korean Peninsula.、Um, and so, you know, has Moscow's uh, 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 perceptions changed, strategic perceptions changed、um, in the last, you know, several months uh, 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 towards the Pacific? Second question is this you know, you talked about so Russia's dependence on China、uh, and how that is likely to go up.、Um, And I think that's a very important point.、Um, and we need to think about it in terms of expectations,、um, but, and also in a way that 
does China and Russia, do they actually have the capacity to meet one another's expectations? And that's something that I'd like you to sort of, you know, delve into a little bit more uh, if you could. Um, and, you know, because that will really tell us about, that will really unveil the real reality of the relations between China and Russia, but also the sustainability of the relations between China and Russia. In that, you know, even if it falls of a full alliance, which I do agree on that point, you know, how much would they actually cooperate? And how, or how much can they actually cooperate with one another? Uh, Dr. Gzanski, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you uh, and your points were very good. Um, and you know, your talk and also uh, uh, Professor Kness, you know, both of you, both your discussions, you know, uh, you know, talked a lot about so the, the dilemmas, but also the hedging. Um, and so I've sort of combined my questions for both of you. In that, when we talk about the strategic hedging by many of the Arab uh, states. How you know how much concerns and dilemmas are there by the central Arab states or other uh, uh, sorry or I should say Arab states overall? How much concerns and dilemmas are there by the Arab states concerning contingencies or circumstances involving China? Uh, you know, of course, all discussion was about so Russia and uh, you know Russia's uh, war in Ukraine and so forth. But what about again China? You know, would there be more dilemmas and more questions that will come out uh, from all this, uh, particularly when it comes to Taiwan Strait? So how does uh, I'm always I've always been curious about how the Middle East is, Middle Eastern states view the Taiwan contingency, um, you know, uh, and so forth. And also, are there have there been any changes in perceptions in the Middle East, uh, you know, concerning hybrid warfare, which seems to be one of the key things about sort of uh, sort of the uh, Russia uh, Ukraine uh, war. Another question, and I guess this sort of, uh, relates more uh, to uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Kanasis' uh, talk is, um, you know, obviously hedging is not the best, and you and you underlined that point very well. Uh, but it is the least disruptive option. Now, when we think about that aspect, that means that the hedging strategy is, in fact, quite short term. Uh, and you talked about this um, uh, um, in, in your in your presentation uh, uh, quite a bit. But I was wondering, like, you know, whether you could uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on how sustainable is this hedging strategy, and will there be other options that the states in the Middle East and also, of course, Turkey uh, that would there be a more long-term strategy that they will want to work on or is there an alternative that they'll be working on in the background as all of this is going? My final question is to all three of you is that if we connect all the things that we've discussed so far together and collate them together and get try to get a more macro picture, where do we go from here? Um, you know, it's hard to predict or speculate future scenarios, but what will be some of the key questions that you would suggest, you know, all of us to think about uh, in the years going forward. So again, I think, uh, you know, I thank our three distinguished speakers. Uh, I learned a hell of a lot. You know, I've, or, I've, I've already have, uh, you know, tons of sheets of paper that I went through with all these notes and so forth. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Yu Koizumi, for uh, uh, facilitating this. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things that we can th uh, think about here. You know, it's always a great conference when you have more questions than answers, uh, you know, because that, you know, we can make a lot of answers out of all that, you know, uh, through discussion. So I look forward to that. Again, thank you very much. Uh, and that's it for me. Over.山口さん、え、非常に鋭いコメントありがとうございました。えっと、今これからの先生方にお答えをいただくと、置こうと思うんですが、え、ちょっと時間が足りないので、まず池内先生にですね、え、もうコメントをいただいて、それらに対してまと
uh, or just residing in the Middle East. And um, nowadays, uh, um, uh, many, you know, uh, Russian experts are coming out of Russia. And then the, the usual destination is uh, mm, Europe and also Turkey and uh, Gulf. And also um, Dr. Um, Professor Shaban is hmm, taking deep, some deep from um, to uh, Istanbul, um, Ankara and now residing in, I, I believe in um, Doha. And also um, uh, Dr. Guzanski, of course, in Tel Aviv, uh, Israel, but after the uh, Abraham Accords, uh, there's a, a very strong connection or interaction between two countries, uh, formerly um, 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 <laughs> theoretically enemy countries in East, East Israel and the United Arab Emirates. So, um, so now, now there's a um, um, unusual uh, movement of people from Israel to UAE. Um, I, I I was in Abu Dhabi um, last week and I witnessed the, that that um, in, in, uh, congestion of uh, traffic between um, Israel and um, United Arab Emirates. So um, there's an uh, apparent you know new centrality of the Gulf and uh, um, and uh, neighboring uh, major regional powers like. Uh, um, Turkey and uh, Israel. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the Middle East, um, uh, as your um, um, comment and uh, um, remarks have, have showed us, Middle East is no longer center of, you know, conflicts or crisis, but uh, rather nowadays Middle East is more um, part of the um, solution, not the part of the Problem. So um, I, I just want to you want to have um, comments or, or observation from all of uh, the the three uh, speakers about the how do you see the Middle East and particularly Gulf countries other you know uh, and its importance in the world politics. Of course, um, it's stru structurally it's still um, part of the sub system, and there's a center away from the Middle East. But there's an apparent apparent centrality or and uh, influence uh, coming from the Middle East. This is one my, one of my comments and questions. Uh, another one is a more broader one. Uh, this is um, I, I just like to hear. Uh, all of you, you know, three of the distinguished guests uh, about um, each each opinion about the notion, very prevalent and popular notion or concept uh, of the multipolar world. Uh, it, it's a, it's originally this multipolar, you know, uh, world um, idea it came from a. Um, the former prime minister or foreign minister of Russia, uh, uh, Evgeny Primakov, I believe. And but nowadays, uh, so many people are very, very, you know, casually using this and just um, describing in in a popular way uh, the the or the status of the world. Uh, but uh, as expert from different backgrounds. Um, uh, uh, how do you see this idea of the, you know, mul uh, multipolarity, multipolarity of the world, and how is it real, or how how is it theoretically? How, how do you see this idea? Now, that's my uh, two question. Hi, Ikeuchi Sensei, Yamaguchi Sensei, Domo, Arigatou Gozaimashita. えっと、それではですね、え、まずガブエフ先生から順番に今2人のコメンテーターからの質問とコメントに対してお答えをいただこうと思います。えっと、ちょっと時間がなくなってきてしまって大変申し訳ないんですが、5分ぐらいでお願
thank you so much. Thank you so much for the excellent questions and for this panels. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, on the in the Pacific, who has been mostly negative, except as something originating from the U.S. as something artificially imposed on the region. Russia loves to buy whatever concept there is originating from the U.S. or American allies. It's not always very literate about the origin of some concept, and it's not all the time very pragmatic. Why would you want to be angrily pushing back against the Indo-Pacific concept, for example, where Sergei Lavrov visits New Delhi and speaks in front of Prime Minister Modi and all of the foreign policy elite in a venue like Rizina Dialogue, uh, very angrily criticizing the Indo-Pacific as a concept that is imposed on the region by the U.S. to tear it apart or push India away from its natural partners, Russia and China. doesn't look very serious, but that's exactly what Russia is uh, engaged in. I think that Russia had uh, an ambition to become a power uh, in the Indo-Pacific and become more involved to reorient its exports to Indo-Pacific and arrive at a balanced trade structure where uh, half of your trade goes westward, but half of your trade is with the Indo-Pacific and also try to diversify ties in the region, not put all of the eggs in basket China, but also try to rapprochement with Japan during Prime Minister Abbas uh, tenure, uh, try to build ties with the Republic of Korea and with India in particular, as well as with ASEAN. A uh, problem right now is that because of the terrible war against Ukraine, Russian options get increasingly limited. Ties with all of the US allies are nearly broken. There was some pragmatism regarding Japanese investment in large Russian projects like Samal uh, uh, Arctic LNG2. Uh, but by and large, uh, I don't think that this relationship will go back to pre-February 24 levels before the war is over and there is a, a, a peace treaty between Russia and Ukraine, which I take years if it materializes at all. Uh, so Russia has no other options as to increase and double down. Uh, it's uh, We need to remember that trade with uh, China this year again, and the year is not over, is 170 uh, billion US dollars plus, whereas trade with uh, India is just uh, $17 billion. Uh, and maybe this year, because of the higher oil prices, it will be 30 in total, but it's still this huge gap. Long-term India as part of Quad, uh, as a country that looks at China as a strategic competitor, as part of the problem that it has with Pakistan, is increasingly skeptical about Russia's ability to stay independent from China and to push back against some Chinese demands with regard to India. I mentioned uh, weapons transfers. So I think that we, we're going to see an increasingly aligned uh, Russian position with the Chinese position. Uh, Russia increasingly uh, subdued and subordinated to what China wants, not fully subordinated. We see that China has tremendous leverage over North Korea, and yet Pyongyang can uh, have independent policies of China. Russia is a much stronger country. But nevertheless, we're going to see much more Chinese influence over Russia. And again, this tunnel vision of President Putin uh, trying to stick it back to the US. So, uh, on the question of uh, mutual uh, 
Is it on? All right. On the second question, very briefly, I think that uh, the Russian and Chinese expectations are quite realistic. The Russians don't expect China to flee back Moscow in this war. The Russians have an experience of placing a lot of hopes on China after 2014. These hopes have not been fully materialized. And I think that Russia clearly understands that China has a vital priority to keep pragmatic ties with the West as long as it is possible. The trajectory of uh, China-US uh, relationship is a downward spiral. There will be more systemic competition across multiple domains, uh, including technology. Uh, but as long as China can continue enjoying access to some of the US and Western tech and to the markets and to the capital, it will do so. Uh, there is a remarkable interview of Senator Andrei Denisov, who just recently retired from his 10 years tenure as Russia's ambassador uh, to China, where he's very much on the record saying that we shouldn't expect too much from China, but at the same time, the amount of support we are getting is crucial to carry on and weather uh, this uh, period. Thank you so much. ガブエフ先生どうもありがとうございました。えっとそれではあのプレゼンテーションの順番にお話あのレスポンスを伺いたいと思います。じゃあ次はグザンスキー先生お願いできますでしょうか。And I want to I want to emphasize three points. We don't have a lot of time, and I want to be brief, but to the point, and maybe dramatic a little bit with my uh, things. You mentioned multipolarity. And the triangle, I think the triangle is concerning the Middle East is US on the one side, Arab countries in the middle, and China on the other side. China is the big issue, I'm sorry to say, not Russia. And I have three comments on China after visiting and viewing uh, Xi uh, in Saudi Arabia. China. Uh, as I think, uh, perhaps not officially, you will not hear that from China, but I think China has chosen the Arab side of the Gulf. Uh, China always maintained a balance in, the, in its relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the other uh, side of the Gulf. Its official policy is of non-intervenience, of we will not intervene, and we will work with everyone. And of course, it wants stability because it wants the oil prices and the oil to flow from, from the Gulf. But if you look at trade, investment, visits, and even gradually selling of military equipment, uh, missiles, and perhaps even nuclear cooperation, I think in the eyes of China, uh, the Arab Gulf is much more relevant uh, to its future. And if you ask the Arab Gulf countries, China is much more relevant to their future. Every Arab Gulf country has its development plan. For Saudi Arabia 2030, for the UAE 2040, for Kuwait, for Oman, everyone tried to diversify their economy and to lower their dependence on oil and to attract investment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. China is vital for them if they want to survive. If you ask, Saudi's leadership, uh, even people on the street, they see China differently uh, perhaps than what the US see. And they see China is vital. And I wanna emphasize this, China is vital to their future, to their stability of kings and emirs in the Gulf. This is one. Uh, uh, the other one I think is China. China is trying more and more uh, to drive a wedge between US and its allies in the region, especially the Emiratis and the Saudis. I think they do it more than in the past. Maybe they have more, um, I should say, uh, they perhaps feel more comfortable uh, doing that, trying to drive a wedge 
they see the cracks, they see the tensions between the Saudis and the Americans and others, and they're trying to go in and expand their influence in the Middle East and especially in the Gulf. The third element that I want to emphasize is about hedging. I wrote my dissertation on hedging and published a lot about this strategy. And I want to say something about it. The, 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 the biggest change that we saw in the recent year in light of the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis that followed is not perhaps a change in great power competition, and not in the Middle East and not elsewhere. What we saw in the Middle East is that the countries, the regional countries, the small countries or the medium uh, countries feel more important. And this is especially true for the Gulf countries. And they hedge their bets more than before between the great powers. This is, I think, the, the, the biggest change. Not the great powers competition and behavior, but the middle powers behavior hedging between uh, the great powers. This is, the, this is dramatic change. And we saw a great effect, and it will continue to affect. And I'm researching and writing a, a, a lot about that subject right now. We will see it will continue. And it without, it's not without cost. I think the countries will pay and perhaps already paying a price in their relations with the US. And this is perhaps uh, for them, maybe they're paying a price now, but maybe they're thinking on their future, as I mentioned before, and they need China in their future. So maybe this is a long-term strategy. This is too soon to say it's happening as we speak, but this is, I think, dramatic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and can, uh, would you would you just uh, just uh, one one you know respond? Uh, would you include the no, to, yes, to those you know to those um, hedging uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, also Israel? You know, would you include Israel? This is a very good question. Uh, I think Israel tried in the past perhaps to do more with China. But I think Israel cannot hedge like the UAE and Saudi Arabia. I think Israel is more dependent and connected to the US mm -hmm. and cannot afford. Mm -hmm. It will cost Israel dearly. Mm -hmm. I think Israel is a different uh, uh, case, perhaps, is connected to the US, not just you know with interest, but I think it's much more deep, uh, this connection. Mm -hmm. So I think the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Israel's case, if Israel will hedge, it will cost Israel dearly. And I mm -hmm. think it already cost Israel uh, in its relations with the US. Thank you very much. Another, uh, another interesting country mm -hmm. in the Gulf mm -hmm. that is not hedging, it's mm -hmm. hedging regionally with Iran, but it's not hedging globally is Qatar. Mm -hmm. Qatar chose the US to be on the U.S. side. Mm. And it's very interesting to see that Qatar is on the U.S. side, but Saudi Arabia and the UAE are hedging with China. This is very interesting. Yeah, very interesting point. So uh, I'll be back to Israel in, in, the, in January. So uh, uh, let's talk about it <laughs> in the coming months. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Actually, yeah, I mean, hedging, uh, again, just to reiterate, is not just a short-term uh, opportunistic reaction that popped up in the midst of this crisis. It has been structurally uh, building up as a preferred strategy for uh, many powers. Therefore, what you all said is uh, very uh, relevant and it won't disappear. I mean, no strategy comes without any cost. Each strategy has a certain cost. And the reason why I think personally, uh, myself and you all uh, have been making uh, this argument that it is gonna be there, the costs of hedging uh, seem to be tolerable from the perspective of these actors. At least they realize that the potential cost, what is the potential cost? The potential punishment, right? Uh, by uh, the United States 
especially uh, when it comes to the Gulf countries in terms of or true in the form of denial of security guarantees, so on and so forth. Uh, this is the main cost uh, being left out of uh, US security umbrella, so on and so forth. It seems that these countries see that this is not something that deter them from uh, going that uh, path, choosing that strategy. And this is where I think uh, also regarding uh, China, what is important uh, is the definition of security. Usually when we talk about uh, security, we tend to think more in terms of the conventional security, uh, state to state military security, but the definition of security is also broad, right? There are non-conventional dimensions of security. And this is, I think, where the recent discussions about China and technology and the uh, 5G, so on and so forth are important. Maybe the US uh, has a monopoly in terms of providing military security guarantees to the regional countries, but in other spheres of security, it is not the US uh, going with China, working with China is, something that serves their security needs. And the other definition of security, the regime security, especially controlling of society's populations, the technological dimension at times might be more important than the uh, conventional military security. And that's why uh, the engagement uh, with China uh, will continue and it is uh, induced by the system. Uh, I think the time is really uh, tight. And uh, regarding this uh, centrality of the Middle East uh, raised by Ikawichi, and as you, you all also mentioned, uh, overall uh, in on the sidelines of uh, or independent of the great power uh, politics, the middle powers or the rest uh, the rest has been already becoming more and uh, more relevant in world politics. There is a kind of uh, shift of power from the center, diffusing of power, and this is what uh, keeps uh, the other uh, players, such as the Middle Eastern players, relevant on the world stage. But uh, let's go back to one point I made toward the end of my presentation about the conventional energy geopolitics. Let's also be honest, what makes the Middle East or certain Middle Eastern powers so relevant is their critical uh, position uh, in the uh, conventional uh, energy geopolitics. Right now, the reason why they are suddenly on the world stage, why the, suddenly the EU uh, and European countries discovered the Gulf, they keep touring uh, the Gulf capitals, the visits, the forums, so on and so forth, is because of their bare need for the uh, conventional energy uh, resources. So this recent uh, rise of the relevance, centrality is to some extent a structural uh, trend. Of course, the uh, rest is important in world politics, but to some extent at this uh, juncture is because of the relevance of the conventional energy geopolitics. And very last point about the multipolarity. Of course, this concept uh, from a scholarly perspective has been always uh, there. Uh, I wrote my own dissertation about unipolarity and uh, uh, the dynamics of unipolar uh, politics. Uh, this was always something that was expected by the realists. You remember we discussed with uh, Professor Stephen Bolt uh, since the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union from a, a theoretical uh, academic point of view, multipolarity was always expected. Mm. One day, uh, in one way or another, eventually it will come. This is the main uh, realist thinking. But of course, uh, this is a theoretical uh, proposition. But the reality is more important, the political uh, reality, but economic power uh, projections, these are all relevant. And uh, the shift of power away uh, from transatlantic to Asia is one thing that is feeding it. But it is not just uh, the economic power; it has also be uh, it has to be related to the determination of certain actors to turn the world politics into a kind of multipolar uh, scene, and this has come to our uh, attention with uh, 2007 uh, President uh, Putin's 
speech at the Munich uh, Security uh, Conference. He used that uh, concept openly called for a multipolar world. Mm -hmm. But personally, I think we are not there yet. So what we are observing is not necessarily uh, a truly uh, multipolar as in the 19th century. Uh, uh, kind of a classical realist Kissinger way of uh, understanding multipolarity. We are seeing the erosion of unipolarity, diffusion of power, but not necessarily emergence of a multipolar order yet. But of course, the implications of the conflict, uh, the alignments, realignments, uh, we may uh, go there. This was one of the questions uh, posed by uh, Yamaguchi-san. Mm -hmm. Where are we heading? Uh, multipolarity, I guess, is one of the options, but it is not certain that we will end up in uh, multipolarity. Mm. I can uh, finish uh, with this uh, observation if possible. Thank you very much. Karadas先生,どうもありがとうございました. あの、ちょっと え、最後までお付き合いいただきました、え、オーディエンスの皆さんもどうもありがとうございました。